Fantastic. Well, good morning, everyone. This is our Tips and Tricks for Autodesk AutoCAD Part 2. So just a couple of things real briefly. Um, we will have all attendees muted throughout the call. If you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A panel. Um, I will attempt to answer as many questions as I can following the presentation. Also, if you do have questions, you know, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. If it's something that's on the slide that I'm currently on, I can definitely do what I can to try and answer those. But we, if any of you have been on my webinars before, we definitely know that we are, uh, we go through these fairly quickly and um, there's usually all the way up to the full hour that we've allotted for this. So we'll go through and do that. So just a little bit about myself. My name is Ryan Wunderlich. Um, I have 34 years of AutoCAD experience across multiple industry segments. My first version was 2.5 for DOS. So I should tell you how long I've been doing this. I've taught AutoCAD at Community College as a certified instructor. I've had 15, or more than 15 years in the CAD management realm. Um, the last job I had before moving on to Imagine It was I was in, I was about eight and a half years in cruise ship building both new build and revitalizations. Um, I've done five years of support for civil survey and landscape architecture before that, as part of that converting offices um, of 200 plus users over from land desktop to civil 3D. I've pretty much worked in every field except for aerospace. That's the only one I haven't done yet. And I do have a bachelor's in business management and a master's in organizational management. So that's just a little bit about me. Going on, oh, the other thing is I'm very passionate about CAD. Those of you who have talked to me before, and I know some of you on the webinar I've actually spoken to personally, you know that I'm very passionate about this. So we're gonna have a lot of fun. That's how I do things. So we're gonna talk today about tips and tricks part two. So as part of this tips and tricks, we're gonna cover seven items today. We're gonna talk about pick style. We're gonna talk about change space. We're gonna talk about PDF import. We're gonna talk about the difference between attribute edit and an enhanced attribute edit and why those are different and important. We're also going to talk about attribute sync. This is the one that most people don't know about. And we'll talk about that and show an example. We're also going to talk about the difference between flatten and flat shot. There is a difference between those and they do have different functionality. And then the last thing we're going to end up with is data extraction. Data extraction is one of my favorite utilities that is not used very often simply because People don't know or are intimidated about it because you can get a lot of stuff out of a data extraction without having to manually go through and do certain things. We can automate that. And yes, the slideshow will be available after the webinar. I have already copied Lori with the PDF of the slides. And then as she said before, there will be, um, we will be posting this to YouTube. So again, pick style. First things off is the system variable. So once you set it, it will remain set until you change it. The default is one, and pick style controls how groups and hatching is selected. So as the default of one, that means that groups, when you click on a group of items, what's going to anything that's been grouped, it's going to show as like a block or something else like that. If you have it set to two, it will only show associative hatches. And that means that it will, when you click on it, it will not only select the hatch, it will select the correct boundary. Three selects groups and associated hatch. And then if you have it set to zero, no group or selection or associated hatch. So we're gonna just do a quick demonstration here of pick style. So if I come back to my AutoCAD here real quick. So what we have here, just to kind of give you an idea, let me move this off here so that you don't see that. So what we have here is we actually have a AutoCAD drawing. And so this is actually a group of circles and this is a hatch. Okay, and you'll see when I click on the hatch, it does not select the boundary. And bear with me one moment, I forgot to do one thing. Let me set that to do not disturb, there we go. All right, so let's go back to my drawing right here. So. What we're gonna talk about here is pick style. So if I change pick style to zero, you'll see when I click on this group of objects, I can select the individual object here. I can move this object here. And you'll see that while it appears that these are no longer grouped, now if I go back and change pick style to one, pick style back to one, you will see that it did allow me to change the objects in the group. And I can change geometry inside the group. So that's a big thing. Um, if you have pick style set to zero, you are gonna get some really odd behaviors. 
The other thing, if I go pick style to two, you'll see that my group comes in as individual objects, but my hatch now actually shows the boundary. The biggest danger with this is that if you click on this with pick style of two or three and you delete the hatch, it's also going to delete the boundary. And if I go pick style of three, you'll see that my hatch shows up with the boundary and this does show up as a correctly grouped object. That's pretty easy to understand. It's not terribly difficult, but just something to be aware of. Usually I leave pick style as one. I don't usually find very, very many times when I need to change that. Um, if you do prefer to grab the hatch and the boundary together, then you know definitely set pick style of two or three. Just be aware is that if you do click on the hatch and it does select the boundary with it, if you try to erase the hatch, it will erase the boundary. That's a big thing to understand. The same thing with here. So if I go back to pick style of, let's say, zero, and I click on this circle and delete it, it will delete the circle out of that group. So just real quick, not, not too much to understand about that, right? So the second thing we're going to talk about, change space. This is another one that's been around for quite some time and allows you to move objects from model space to paper space and from paper space to model space and maintain the apparent scaling. So when changing from model to paper space, paper space it will scale the object up or down to ensure that the same size is maintained. The reverse is also true for paper space to model space. Where you find that is under your home tab, you expand out your modify and you will see the change space icon right here and we will just go ahead and gen generate a quick change space. So what you'll see here is this is my model space. I'm gonna jump over to paper space and you'll see I have a couple of blocks here in paper space. So let's say I wanna move these. Let's say I didn't realize I was actually in layout and let's say I was in the model space and zoomed in because I'd locked the viewport, but I actually want these objects here to appear. So we go to modify, we go to change space. We select our two objects here I go enter and it wants to know which viewport. Automatically it threw them into this viewport and so now if I go back to model space you'll see those objects are here and they are correctly scaled and they have been removed from the paper space viewport or the paper space and now they're part of the model space. And the reverse is true. If I'm in the viewport here and I go back up to modify and I go back to change space, I can click on these objects here and when I hit enter it now puts them back into paper space. It's a really clever way, especially if you've done something incorrectly or you put something on, in the wrong space. You know, as we've all done, we come in here. And for example, if we go ahead and lock the viewport, right? And we're in here and let's say we're in here and we don't realize maybe we're drawing something and we don't realize that we are in paper space and we are in the model space view. We draw something, maybe we need it in paper space. Quick and easy. Moving on. PDF import. This is the one where I struggle with the most. This is the one that people call in um, significantly for because it's not doing something that you want. So the PDF import command is, allows you to import geometry, fills, raster images, and true type text from a PDF into the current drawing. The visual fidelity along with some of the properties such as PDF scales, layers, and line weights and colors can be preserved. PDFs are a common way of publishing or sharing design data for review or markup. AutoCAD supports creating PDF files as publishing output or plotting output, and we can re-import that PDF data into AutoCAD using one of two options. We can attach them as an underlay, which is similar to how an XREF works. The other thing we can do, let's see, if you try and edit the hatch vertices when the boundary is selected, will it add a vertex to both? Uh, yes, if it will, if if the hatch is set, sorry, if the hatch is set to a boundary hatch or you have a boundary, if you go in and edit the boundary and add a vertex and stretch that out, normally it will update unless you run into a situation where ray casting does not work. Um, in my last, I think it was my last webinar, I talked about some of the issues with hatching. If not, I do have one that does talk about that, I believe. Um, the other thing is, whoops, let me go back, sorry. Sorry about that. The PDF data can also be imported as objects in part or entirely, which can be used as reference and modified. The important thing to understand is if you choose 
If you import the PDF data, you can choose to specify a page from a PDF file, or you convert all or part of an attached PDF underlay to AutoCAD objects. So, Bezier curves are converted into circles and arcs if they're within a reasonable tolerance to those shapes, otherwise they're converted to 2D polylines. Elliptical shapes can be converted into 2D polyline splines or ellipses, depending on how they're stored in the PDF. As an option, you can set each set of approximately collinear segments can be combined into a polyline with a dashed line type named PDF import, and compound objects such as dimension leaders, pattern hatches, and tables will result in many separate objects if these objects were exploded. Um, is there any way to make the PDF not slow down in the drawing? If you are importing the PDF and using it as an XREF type rather than converting the geometry, the reason why your AutoCAD slows down is that it's, it's parsing it as an image. It's the same as if you'd inserted like a TIFF image or a JPEG. It will cause some slowdown. If, if the PDF you are bringing in is vector-based, and I'm going to show you the difference between a vector and a raster-based. If it's vector-based, my recommendation is to import it as CAD geometry into a separate DWG and then XREF that. So the solid filled areas are imported as 2D solids or optionally as solid filled hatches. They're assigned to 50% transparency to make sure that any text within the area is visible. Any text that uses true type fonts is preserved, but text that originally used SHX fonts is imported as separate geometric objects. There is a newer function that does try and emulate and or determine which SHX was used in the 2020 version. So that does help, but in some cases, those SHX fonts, especially if they're not out-of-the-box ones, if they are not the out-of-the-box SHX fonts that are included with AutoCAD, generally they get exploded into just standard daylighting. Or, sorry, sorry, reading the comments, they just get, they just get imported as standard uh, lines, arcs, and circles. Raster images... Basically, if that PDF is a raster-based PDF, so for example, if you grabbed a print off, went to your scanner, scanned it, scanned it as a PDF, brought it in, it's going to be raster-based, which means that it's going to automatically create a PNG image and attach that image just exactly the same as if it were an image file that you'd XREFed in. Any point objects are converted to zero-length polylines, and the big thing is, is PDF markups are not imported. So if you have a PDF that has markups on it, all of those markups are ignored when you bring that in. So to launch the PDF import command, you go to insert and you go to click on PDF import. You'll browse to a PDF file. You'll select the PDF that you're going to want and click open. In the dialog box here, you'll see the name. And then we're going to talk about the different options here. So specify insertion point on screen, obviously scale. This is very important. So if you have a drawing that you have, know has a known scale and was properly printed, you can modify that scale here in order to bring it in. So if it's one quarter inch equals a foot, you'd put in 48. If it's one eighth inch equals a foot, you'd put in 96 for the scale. And then we'll properly scale this. PDF that you bring in and should normally in most cases bring in the information correctly and at scale. Now the other thing to understand is your PDFs that you have, vector-based PDFs are only good out to two decimal places so there is a little fudge factor especially if you work with higher tolerances as far as decimal points so not all dimensions may come in exactly as you want because again PDF is only going to two decimal places. And you can choose to rotate it on import. So if your preview looks incorrect, go ahead and fix the rotation scale here. Now, when you're bringing in your PDF data, you want to bring in your vector geometry. If you have the check mark under solid fills, anything that has a solid fill will actually be brought in. And you do want it to go ahead and parse any true type text. So if there was true type text used in the PDF, what's going to happen is it will bring it in as a text object. So it will actually bring it in as dtext or mtext. It's usually dtext. So single line text. If you put a check mark under raster images, so if there is a raster image in here or if the PDF is raster by itself, you will want to check this and that will create that second PNG file and then bring it in automatically in the same correct location. For your layers, you can use PDF layers. So if the PDF has layers associated in it, you can actually bring those in. You can have it create specific object layers 
or you can just bring it in on the current layer of your drawing. And then your import options down here. Do you want to import this as a block? I usually like to import it as a block to start with simply because then I can scale it if I missed the scale, if it did not scale correctly. And then I only have to select one object. I'm going to join line and arc segments. So what it will do is try and create complete polylines, convert solid fills to hatches. So anything that it sees as a solid fill here will not come in as a solid. It'll actually be a hatch object. Apply line weight properties, so if there are line weights associated to these, it will actually bring those in. And the big one is infer that line types from collinear dashes. So if you have someone who drew it as a bunch, you know, let's say hidden line type, it will actually register the fact that it's hidden line type. And once it does that, it will create one single polyline that it will give it its own line type style. And again, because I went through these fairly quick, there's a link right here that talks about specifically all those options. And then I'm going to demonstrate both a rect vector and a raster PDF. So we have just a blank drawing here. And again, I'm going to go to Insert, and I'm going to go PDF Import. I'm going to go down to my webinar drive. And you'll see I have a vector example right here. I'm going to click on this, and because I know and if you'll hang on just a second, let me go ahead and open up that PDF real quick, because this is where that scale becomes very important. So in my PDF right here, you'll see that there's a floor plan I'm bringing in, and you'll see my scale is 1 half inch equals a foot. So that means that this is 12 divided by 1 half, which would be 24. So we would want to bring this in a scale of 24. So I'm going to specify my scale here at 24. And I'm just going to go ahead and select everything here, just so that it brings everything in correctly. And I'm going to click OK. And what it should do is it should process it down here. You'll see it's processing those elements. And then it will turn around and bring this in. And you will see now that we actually have a PDF in here. And if I actually run a distance command from here to here, you will see that that door is 38 inches wide. So that appears to be exactly what I wanted to bring in. And this is all CAD geometry. So this is currently a block. Once I explode this block, I can go ahead and erase particular pieces of information. So for example, if I don't want the title block in this drawing like this, and now I have something that somebody actually drew, sent me in CAD, and now I can actually go in here and manipulate this as if it were CAD objects. This was a solid hatch, and it actually turned around and created this type of hatch where it basically does a fill with this, so I would have to erase those. This, it also did the same thing, and this, it also did the same thing. These were all hatches I put in here to show you. So hang on, Mike, we'll come back to you here on that question in just a moment. So that's bringing in more or less a vector-based PDF. All of my stuff here is vectorized, so this is essentially now an AutoCAD drawing. If I wanted to use this drawing, I would do a file save as. Now I have a DWG. Now I can use this as an XREF and not modify this geometry. That will help your PDF slow down. So the other thing we're going to do is show you what happens in the case of a raster PDF. So I'm going to go PDF import, and you'll see I have a raster example here. And I'm simply going to come in here, and I'm going to select which page I want. In this case, I am going to specify where I want it on screen. And you'll see what it does. It creates a block out of it. And you will see that this right here is a block. But if I go to my XREF dialog, you will see what it should have done right here. And it actually picked that one up. Okay, never mind. I have a bad example here. This actually brought it in and created text out of it, single line text. But what would have normally happened is that you would have had a new PNG file here, and it would have converted this page into a image from the P PDF, which actually is better to work with. So coming back to you, Mike. Concerning the change space command, is there a way to move multiple rotations of the model space to paper space in separate layout tabs? No, it's a one for one. So whatever orientation you have in the viewport in model space is the orientation that's going to come into 
when you do the change space. How do you share the PNG files if they're saved in one location based on the path variable? Okay, we haven't talked about this, but what I usually recommend is we go to eTransmit right here. It's going to grab your drawing and all the PNG files that are in your drawing, create one zip file, send the whole thing to your customer, you're done. All right, let's come back to here. I meant share a network in my office. Okay, so what you want to do is that is going to be wherever those, those come out. And let's go back here real quick. Let me come back to my AutoCAD drawing. When we do the import here, all right, we're just in a blank drawing right here. When we do our PDF import, what you can do is when you change this, for example, uh, there are no options in this one. Normally you can click on the options dialog here, and what this is going to do is this is going to open up your AutoCAD options to show where your PDF images go. You could actually put this back on a network share. And that's what I would recommend. Or you basically go back and you harvest those out of this PDF Im images here, and you put that in the network share where the drawing is located. All right, moving on. Attribute edit versus enhanced attribute edit. This is the big one. So the attribute edit in green is the original attribute editor. This is what most of us are familiar with. It's limited in the fact that it can only edit the attributes in a block and cannot change any of the properties. The enhanced attribute edit in red is the enhanced attribute editor. You can update the attributes and you can also change text option and properties of the attribute from that particular dialog. The first thing I want you to know is that the attribute edit in green command is the command line version. We actually want the graphical version that brings up a dialog box. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up the QE editor. In the left pane, we're going to expand out ribbon, and then we're going to go to panels. We're going to scroll down until we see the home 2D block, expand out till you get to the multiple and click on it. And in the right box, we're going to change minus ATT edit to just edit. So we're getting rid of the minus sign and then we apply and close all right so let's do that right now so we're going to come in here we're going to go into QE let's bring up our QE editor again we come to our ribbon we come down to panels we're going to come find home 2d right here 2D block. I usually have this changed, so I actually put it back so that you guys can actually see this in process. Right, so we come back to 2D block right here. We expand this out. We expand out row two. We'll see the attribute display. One row three, edit attributes. Expand that out, you'll see multiple, you'll see that this is currently set here. And I can't stress this enough to get this changed correctly. You'll see it says minus ATT edit. All I do is come in, remove the minus sign. And I also do the same thing up here, remove the minus sign. I hit apply and I hit OK. So now when we are here, we come to edit attributes and we click the multiple attributes. I select the block and we get the typical attribute dialog box. This is what I like. So you can change the numbers right here. When you're done, you hit OK. And if you just keep hitting Enter through, it just cycles back through all of them. This is what I'm used to. This is what I like to use. That's the first thing I usually change. All right, so we've done that part. So this is the attribute edit box where you see just the attributes that are associated to that box. This will actually show all the attributes and, and whether or not they're invisible, hidden, etc. The other thing is the enhanced attribute editor gives you your attributes, the same thing here. It also gives you text options and properties. And let's talk about the, well, I'm gonna show you both of these in just a moment. And then we're gonna talk about attribute sync. This is something that I've used in the past. This actually helps. So this command attribute sync 
updates instances of block containing attributes that were redefined using the block or the bedit command at sync does not change any values assigned to attributes in existing block. Now the attribute sync removes any format or property changes made with the attribute editor e or the enhanced attribute editor command also deletes any extended data associated with the block and might affect dynamic blocks and blocks created with third party applications. So let's go ahead and talk about the differences here. So when we come back to our blocks here, you'll see if I run edit attributes here and I click on this, the thing brings this up right here. This is our standard attribute, so I can change this to seven, hit enter, eight, enter, nine, enter. When I'm done, I click OK, it updates those. If I go to my single attribute and I click on this one, it brings up our enhanced attribute editor, and what I actually have to do now is I have to click in this box here, highlight the value here, and change this to 10. And then I have to do this, come back down here, change this to 11, and I have to click on this one, come down here, and change this to 12 as an example, and apply. The other thing I can do is I could actually change text options. So you'll see that I can actually change this right number right here, which is this tag, I can change that from Romans to standard. You'll see it now becomes the standard text. And there are other things I could do. I could change it to, I could change a layer if I had more than just layer zero in here. I could change line type, I could change color, I could maybe make this cyan, and I can hit OK. So there are some things you can do. The big thing I don't like about the enhanced attribute editor is now you've created a situation where you have blocks that don't match anymore, even though they're the same block. So that's where that at sync actually comes in very handy, this synchronized attributes. So when I click on this, it says select the option. I'm just going to go ahead and hit enter to select. I'm going to select a block. And it says at sync block yes. And you'll see that it will remove any of those extra things that I did and also fix it. The other thing where this comes in handy is that if I go into block and I go into my block editor, so I'll highlight the block, I'll go BE for block editor. Let's say I want to remove one of these attributes. So let's say this right attribute here we don't need. If I delete it and close the block editor and save the block, you will see that none of my attributes actually changed or removed. In order to do that, we need to resync the block. So this is where we go back to sync attributes. All right, we select the block, we go yes, and you'll see that that attribute is now gone from all of those blocks. In the enhanced attribute editor, can you not use enter instead of having to click into each attribute? Well, let's go ahead and show you that. We're going to click here. Right, if I go here, I have to change the value here to 11 or 33, whatever. If I do hit enter, it will scroll down to the next one. All right, 34, enter, it'll take me back up here and I can hit OK. I personally like the other one, that's just because of my familiarity level. You can certainly do that, but usually it's a few more clicks where I like just the regular attribute editor here change my number 55, 56, hit done. So all of those are viable methods. All right, now moving on, we are on to flatten and flat shot. So flatten creates a 2D representation of selected objects, projects them into the current viewing plane. Flatten results in 2G objects that retain their original layers, etc. So what this is, <coughs> hang on. There we go. So what flatten does is if you have objects that have a Z elevation associated to them, you can run the flatten command. And in most cases, it will flatten those out to elevation of Z equals zero. The flat shot command is different. So you create flattened 2D representations of a 3D model projected into the XY plane. The resulting objects can be inserted as blocks or saved as separate drawings. This is very useful in creating technical illustrations. So flatten can be used anywhere in model space or paper space, right? Go to express tools, come down under where it says modify and that's flatten objects. Flat shot can only be used in model space 
and the flat shot shortcut is only available in the 3D modeling workspace. You can always type in flat shot to get to it, even if you're not in the 3D modeling workspace. So let's go back to here. So what I have in here is I have an object. And if I look at this in the southwest orientation, you'll see that I have a 3D object here. And I have a what appears to be a square, but it is not a square. If I look at it in the top view, you'll see it appears to be a square. So if we go flatten, right, modify, flatten objects, click on this object right here and hit enter. Do I want to remove any hidden lines? I'll hit enter here. And now if we look at it, it should have flattened everything out to elevation Z equals zero. Now let's say I do want to do a technical illustration and I have this particular object right here. We're going to go to this one, make it look really cool. Right, so I, again, I'm going to have to switch workspaces. So I'm going to go from here. I'm going to go to 3D Modeling Workspace. And again, based on this, what we want to do is we want to come find our flat shot right here. It's under Section Plane. You expand that down under Section. So again, it's under section here. We're going to go ahead and do flat shot. It's going to say insert is a new block, replace the exact block. We could actually export this to a new DWG from here. In our particular case, I'm going to insert as a new block. I'm going to set these to by layer, by layer. Obscured lines, do we want to show obscured lines or do we not? So in our particular case, I'm not going to show any obscured lines. I hit create and it creates me a flat image in the XY plane inserts it as a block and now if I go back to my top view here you'll see that's exactly what we were looking at it is a block image that is completely flat um, the flat shot command and flatten are not available in LT um, simply because they are they are all 3D functionality and or they are specific LISP routines. Um, LT does not support those. So those are things that you do need to be aware of. This is for full AutoCAD, not LT. Is there an easier, quicker way to see if there are 3D objects embedded in large drawings with multiple items? Will flatten work with, okay, will flatten work with existing 3D blocks or solid? Um, flatten does not work with solids. With 3D blocks, yes, but you have to explode the blocks in order to get them down. Um, is there an easier way? Usually what I want to do, um, if, if you've never used this before, you can go Q select right here. You'll see multiple objects. And in some cases right here, what you may want to look at is a 3D solid or a block reference. And what you want to look for anything that has a position Z value that is not equal to zero and it will find anything that does not have a zero reference. Um, the other thing is to just go into the side view, see if you have objects like this, you know you're going to be there, come back and then you'll know you've got some flattening to do. All right, you want to talk about the ins and outs of base view in the next session. I'm writing that one down. Do these commands work in Civil 3D? Yes, they do. Civil 3D, just so you guys kind of, for those of you that do use Civil 3D, you have to understand Civil 3D is built off the core AutoCAD engine. So on top of core AutoCAD, you have the map functionality, and on top of the map functionality is Civil 3D. Most of the things that I show you, if not all of the things that I show you, are core AutoCAD, because again, I'm in basic AutoCAD. They should work in Civil 3D unless they've been superseded by a specific Civil 3D command. All right, there's flatten versus flat shot. Now we're going to get into my fun one, data extraction. So this is for full AutoCAD, not AutoCAD LT. Now AutoCAD LT does have an extraction wizard that only extracts attributes out of blocks that have them. So I do want to tell you that, that that does work. But 
data extraction in full AutoCAD, this is what I'm going to be showing you today. So this exports object properties, block attributes, drawing information to a data extraction table and or to an external file and specifies a data link to an Excel spreadsheet. This is found under the Insert tab, Linking and Extracting panel. The drawing must be saved before you can run the command. And when you start, we get the Data Extraction Wizard. So it says, what do you want to do? First page, page one of eight. This is, we're going to create a new data extraction. Um, if you have a data extraction that you work, in other words, what this does is this creates a Dixie file, a DXE extension. You can use a previous DXE, um, or you can edit an existing one. In our case, we're going to create a brand new one. And the first thing it's going to ask for, what do we want to include for a data source? So I can do the current drawing I have open, or I could actually add other drawings here by clicking on Add Drawings, or I could add an entire folder of drawings. Right? There's also a Settings box here. So do we want to extract objects from blocks, extract objects from XREFs, or include XREF in block counts? Where this is very, where these settings become very important is that if you are dealing with a lot of XREF information, my suggestion is to not get any of that information from the XREFs, simply because that can bog your system down and or give you odd block counts if you have those. And I usually only extract from objects in model space. Generally speaking, you don't want additional items coming from paper space, especially if you're trying to get accurate counts of things. So that's what we're actually going to do. We're going to do some counts. So I can show you how this works. Once you go to the next page, this is where it's going to show you what blocks you have in there. And again, what we have here for display options is all object types. Usually what I do is I will, un I will uncheck this and I will only display blocks because usually I use this for blocks only. If by chance <clears throat> you're in like a civil 3d environment and you want to and let's say you've got autocad points that you want to that are at an elevation with a northing and easting you can actually display non-block information and you could actually export those points out to a csv so then you could turn around and re-import them as like a survey file that's a pretty clever way to go about that Display blocks with attributes only. If you check that, only blocks that have attributes will show up in this list or display objects currently in use. You want to make sure you have this checked just in case you have a block definition defined in your drawing. If it's not inserted anywhere but it's defined, you want to make sure you check that so it only grabs the stuff that's actually working in your drawing. Go to the next page, and then we have to select a property from here. If you're selecting blocks that don't have an attribute, you have to at least pick one item here. In our case, we're going to pick layer. And then I'm going to turn around and do this again with the same drawing where I've added an invisible attribute called maker so that we know the maker of each one of those blocks. You come in here, it'll say we can combine identical rows. So if the block name and the layer is all the same, it will combine these into a composite table like this. We show a count column, so it will actually count these. Um, Lynn, I'll talk, we can talk later during the Q&A. And then show the name column. So this is the name of the block. We click Next here. Where that's going to bring us is it's going to give us our output options. So we can insert this data extraction table into a drawing. So it's going to create an AutoCAD table and automatically fill that in. And that will be linked back to the Dixie file. You can also put in here to output the data to an external file. So you can export it to a, a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, XLS. You can put it in a CSV. You can put it in an MDB, for example, an access database or a .txt file. So if you're doing your counts and need to keep track of those in a separate file, this would be the best way to do that. Once you've done, you've, if you've gone ahead and select, we're going to go ahead and insert the data extraction as a table. It's going to launch your table wizard here. This is our standard AutoCAD table. It will automatically fill all this information in. And then we click Finish. It asks for the insertion point, inserts the table, and now we have accurate block counts. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. We're running out of time, so we're going to do a data extraction demonstration. How does it react with dynamic blocks, being that the block can contain many blocks? That's going to be a view state, and I don't believe data extraction can key in on a view state 
or it may. And I have not tested that recently. I know in the past dynamic blocks did not have a view state show up in there. All right, so let's do our quick data extraction here. So this is our data extraction here. And you'll see this is a standard dining venue of some kind. Um, since this is my bread and butter, this is actually off of a cruise ship. So I know, and you'll see that these are all defined as blocks. So we will go into our data extraction, and we are going to go ahead and move me back to my drafting and annotation. All right, and we're going to launch our data extraction wizard here. And again, I'm going to start with a brand new one. I'm going to click Next. And now it's, <clears throat> now it's asking for the location of my Dixie file, and this will be extraction, no, data extraction with no attributes. I'll click Save. We're going to include the items in the current drawing. And again, I want to go to my settings, and I want to make sure that we're extracting objects from blocks. I don't want to do XREFs, and I only want to capture the stuff in model space. You'll see that my current drawing is here. And again, I could add an additional drawing. I could remove this drawing and do whatever here. And I want to include the current drawing. It's now going through and building that block list. I'm going to remove all display types, and I'm only going to display blocks only. And again, if I were to check this, you'll see that our, our selection here is empty because there are no blocks with attributes. In our case, now we have blocks with attributes. So what I don't want is I don't want my two windows here, but I want everything else because these are all tables. And again, this is where we come in here, and I want to uncheck all. And because there are no attributes, we need to find at least something to key in on. I usually like layer. That's the easiest one to work off of. We go next. And you'll see that it's going to give me one 10 top oval. That's this one. One podium. That's this one. One six top or we've got three six tops that's this one this one and i believe there's another one hiding right there we'll go next and if you don't like how these are sorted here these are sorted by count i can click on name and sort them by name and so 10 top one zero by autocad parlance comes before two t and we can sort them that way we can sort them by count we can do a reverse count here and for example, if I had something different in over here in layer, we could do that as well. So this will also show you the blocks that may be on different layers that should be the same. I'm going to go next. So we're going to insert this in as a data extraction table into a drawing. And we'll come back and talk about the output to an external data file once I've, when we do the other one with attributes. It's going to want to know what it looks like. I click Finish, right? And now we've got to scale this table or style up here so I'm gonna go 36 All right so there's our table and if you click on the table you'll see that you get the links here these are all links so these cannot be updated so I can't double click and edit one of these cells because this is a fixed cell so if I were to make a copy let's say of this and put it here what I would need to do at this point is I need to come back in and update table data links. And you'll see that basically click on the table, right mouse click, and you'll see that this becomes four from three. So this is a really good way of monitoring this. And then if I have a large number of seats, like if you've ever seen a cruise ship and have a large number of deck chairs on there, this is an easy way to make counts of deck chairs so you know how many are up there. Same with any large furniture venues or anything else that you have a block that you need to know. So we're going to repeat this process with attributes. So there are some invisible attributes now. So if I go to our attribute editor and edit this, you're going to see that I have an invisible one called maker. So I've added an invisible or a hidden attribute to these so that I can keep track of who these makers are. And again, we go back through the data extraction, right? We're going to create a brand new one. Attributes. And again, 
We don't want objects from XREFs. We want all objects only in model space. Can data extraction provide a method to extract an external XLS then re-import from XLS so that block attribute could be edited and re-imported? That's a little more complex question. Um, what you would want to do is you'd want to create the initial data extraction um, to create the XLS, and then you want to link that XLS file back in and have bidirectional communication. Um, I can certainly put that on the list to go over. That is not going to be covered in this one because I'm just showing the basics of data extraction. What you're talking about more is um, setting up a table that has an Excel data link so that we can link that data back and forth. So we can definitely put that on the list to talk about. That's a far more advanced function. We'll go next. And now you're going to see that I only want to display blocks. And in this case, I'm going to display blocks only with attributes because I've added those attributes in here to these. We'll go next. And again, I'm going to right mouse click, uncheck all. But what I want is there is a attribute called maker. And I'm going to go next. Right, and you'll see that I have a maker here. So this 10 top oval is from Conference Table R Us. Right, the podium is going to be built on site. Those six tops are from HM Premier Line. The four tops are from Bob's Furniture. Right, the two tops are EA Contemporary, and the two top specials are AF Modern. I'm going to go next. I'm also going to insert a table, and I'm going to go ahead and output my data file. All right, so again, I'm going to go back to my webinar here, and I'm going to put this in here. Here's going to be my defined attributes as an XLF file, XLS. And I go next. And again, I'm going to go ahead and insert the table. Finish. What it's doing in the background is that it also created the XLS file. So if I scale this up by... All right, so here's this, and now I have my maker here. And if I happen to browse out to my webinar folder, right, here's my webinar folder, you'll see that it did actually create me a data extraction table here as an XLS file. So I just double click, opens up Excel. And when Excel opens up, it's going to have this same information right here. So I could easily use this to generate a bill of materials or send this information out to somebody who needs to not know what's in the drawing, but needs to know what they need to have for orders or know what they have. So could you make the Excel file a data shortcut to the drawing so that it continually updates as the drawing changes? All right, you're talking about data shortcut. Data shortcuts are only Civil 3D. Now, however, if I go in and make a modification to this, for example, I add another one and go back through and update the, so if I were to copy another table and go back through the data extraction process, all I need to do is update and it will overwrite that, that XLS with the updated data. But that's a manual process. It won't automatically update that way. Right, you guys have a lot of good questions on data extraction. Probably the first time some of you have ever seen this. I've used it a lot. So, what other questions? At in, at out might be an option to update attributes. It can be, yes. Um, I'm just showing the basics difference between the enhanced attribute editor and the standard attribute editor, as well as attribute sync and what that does. That's all I was showing in this. We haven't gotten into any of the other specifics like at in or at out. So I do apologize. We are definitely running a little later than usual. Um, so let's, let me come back here. We did have data extraction to export points from a Carlson drawing to re-import them as 3D Kogo points. That is going to depend Lynn on how the Carlson drawing reads those points. If they are a specific point type, then yes. Um, that may be difficult. If it's just a standard AutoCAD point with a northing, easting, and a Z elevation, then absolutely you could use data extraction to create a CSV file that would give you point number, northing, easting, and elevation. So then you could turn around and bring that into Civil 3D as a Kogo point.
Okay, um, yep, the table that you're talking about, Mike G, the table, the data extraction is great. Where that's being generated from is the table style. So what I would normally do in my particular case, if I know I'm working on larger drawings, in this particular case, the drawing I was working off of um, was actually scaled metrically, which is why that table was extremely small. Normally, I would have set up a table style specifically for the attribute extraction, and I usually do that in my template so that I have that, so that I don't have that problem where I have to scale it up to be able to see it. So what, again, what I'd normally do is set up my, tables, my table style correctly in my template and work off of that. Uh, data link manager in tables civil 3d only no data link manager you're talking about again this is more of advanced functionality here but what you're talking about is when you go into right and bear with me I prefer the classic interface for this right so when you are in classic I know I can find it under tools and you have data link data link manager this is a core AutoCAD function where you create an Excel data link right here. That's what you're talking about, Paul. That's a basic AutoCAD function. All right. Will this be available to be again? It's a way to extract data from a title block for a document repository vault. All right. Well, I showed you data extraction. The question is going to be how ProjectWise or Blue Clio wants to use that, or uh, Celio. Sorry, Blue Celio wants to use that. So you can extract data from a title block because that's probably attributed data of some kind. If it's not an attribute, then it's going to be very difficult to extract that data. But if it's attributes, then you can go through the same process here to do at least do a data extraction. And then it's a matter of finding out how you can get ProjectWise or, or the other project repository to use that. The EDP or the, what is it, the Electronic Document Management System, your EDMS. All right, and today's recording, any other questions? I don't see anything else coming up right away. So today's recording will be available at, a, at our YouTube channel.